We've, we've talked a lot about ecosystem. Um, we've got a guy now from um, NHS Digital, Peter Coates, who's actually got it in his job title. So Peter's actually the head of ecosystem development. And he's going to talk about the Code for Health platform, um, the Aperta Foundation, and anything else, wherever Peter goes, really. Peter's been evangelising this long before I've been involved. And um, he's very widely read in this subject. I'm sure he can give a, an awful lot of uh, interesting input. Peter Coates. After <laughs> Afternoon, everybody. I'm not tweeting, um, but I haven't done a big presentation other than that slide um, in the interests of saving time. Um, Simon asked me, uh, he said, what are you doing here coming all the way to Plymouth? All the way down from Sunderland for a day. And um, I very rarely do these uh, speaking things. I used to do them a lot and I didn't find that they really added much value. But the reason I'm here is because this is so important. Um, and I think it's important that NHS Digital and uh, Innovation and Partnerships team, which I'm part of, is physically here to show support uh, to this approach that's being taken in Plymouth. I think they really are um, ahead of the game here, even in the UK. There are other, th other pockets of hot activity going on in Leeds um, and in um, solve that we've heard of and genomics, but you know we've got a real system open EP going in here on an open air platform first of type so it is significantly strategically important I think what's going on here and we've been supporting this for um, quite a while now um, both in moral support and uh, with real resource support provided through the Apert Foundation and I'm here to say that we're committed to continue that support going forward so in terms of giving the um, official picture on things. Um, I'm part of a, a, a function within um, NHS Digital, a new function called Innovation and Partnerships, and that is all about R&D and research and learning and trying to um, improve um, NHS Digital's um, support to its customers, be more enabled, be more facilitative, uh, and be more responsive. And one of the ways that we do that is through the Court for Health initiative, which is, we've heard about ecosystems and grassroots. So this is effectively an initiative around the core production of new digital tools and services, um, primarily using clinicians. So clinicians come to us with an idea. Um, they've got a problem, the real world problem they want to solve in their practice, and what help is available to them. And we take a very facilitative and support approach. We're not interested in monetizing the solution. They're generally not interested in making money out of it. And we've, we've been at that for a few years now. And what we found was that we were, we were supporting quite a lot of point solutions that weren't mobile, weren't transportable. And so we looked around and we, we decided that we needed a framework or a set of design principles for these projects to take hold with. So we, we came across the concept of open EHR and open platforms and one thing's led to another and now what we try to do, and it's similar to what, what you're trying to do, is guide those groups of clinicians down a particular design path so we can get maximum value for money, core production, reusable, not locking ourselves into a corner and you know, making the best of, of what we can do and that's what Code for Health is about. And as part of doing that, we leverage any range of assets to these Code for Health communities. Um, and we quickly realised we, need, we needed some form of platform that we could rapidly develop and prototype things on, self-service, make it available, as well as a number of other assets, tools, platforms that these communities have needed uh, to progress their ideas. Yeah? So whether that is um, the clinical knowledge management software that we provide free of charge, whether it's the Black Duck platform, which is asses assesses security vulnerabilities in open source software and licensing conflicts and so on and so forth. We make all of those assets available free of charge to our communities. Yeah. In a bid to speed up the innovation life cycle and make, things re make reusable things. So the Code for Health platform is a very important component of the whole initiative. And that is an open platform. 
based on <coughs> an open air CDR, open standards, and you can use whatever front end dev um, framework of choice. So whether you want to use Swift, whether you want to use app development languages, whether you want to use PHP, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's one of the important components of Code for Health that we would love to see embraced and used in this this ecosystem. Yeah. Um, some of the other things um, that we realised needed to happen, as well as the the, the platform for rapid development, is around uh, the clinical content curation and the democratisation of that. And I'm not going to repeat. Um, what uh, Thomas has said and others have said other, other than to reinforce that's the way that we need to go. And actually in terms of interoperability, um, I don't think it's a technology problem at all. I don't think it's going to be fully solved by messaging because we could have used lots of messaging technologies in the past to solve some of the problems. I think the issue is one around clinical curation, uh, the creation of clinical models and the governance of those models and um, agreement and publishing of those things. And the, and we provide a free-to-use CTM, Clinical Knowledge Manager, for communities to do that and build their projects. And I am going to try and bring that up uh, on the screen at the moment. In terms of um, the Aperta Foundation, that's another one of the elements, another pieces of the jigsaw that we realised about three, year, three years ago when this initiative started in NHS England that we needed some form of a special purpose vehicle yeah, to fulfil a number of roles. So we span this out of NHS England about three years ago. It's completely non-for-profit. Nobody makes any money out of it. Nobody's paid by it. It doesn't employ anybody. Um, and it acts, it was originally set up to act as a, the custodian role, the role that uh, Thomas alluded to that's needed for products such as OpenAP albeit open AP would be the most complicated one that we would ever take on for the reason that's been said. But it acts as a, a safe haven, holds IP, issues assets on open source licenses in perpetuity for reuse by the NHS. It's a community interest company. All those assets are in an asset lot, which means nobody can come along and buy them up and close them up and then exploit them. So it's by the NHS, for the NHS. And that, that was its original purpose, act as the custodian, act as an aggregator of money and IP. So a part receives funding from multiple sources, um, from um, charities, from pharma, um, all uh, very transparent. You know, it's, they've got no sway over how that money is used. Um, and we aggregate that money together and we commission reusable pieces of software or code that can be used. In, in multiple projects. So it can aggregate that and, and also has the, the governance function around that. But more and more, in, increasingly, Apert has really taken a bit of a thought leadership role and has been publishing documents, requests for comments, ideas out to the community um, in the absence of anybody else doing them, really. And one of the key documents that was produced is this, the, it's all in your bag, the, the, the second reprint of it, which is the defining an open platform document. This really sets out um, the case about why we need to change things, which Andy perfectly articulated, and how we need to do it, which Thomas perfectly articulated. So this really makes the case for change, why things aren't working, why they aren't as good as they are, a way forward. And it goes for, it references the Gartner reports, the Essential reports, the McKinsey reports. Uh, and it goes one step further and it starts naming some of the standards um, that we think we should be adopting and using. And the reason this document is really quite important is that when we were running uh, in NHS England the original open source programme, um, that's something that's quite um, objective, it's definite. Somebody can say show me the license that this piece of software are on and, and you can work out whether it's a, a bona fide open source software license and the software is available in GitHub. It's, you can prove it beyond all reasonable doubt. And what we found was that um, vendors in particular picked up on the use of the word open, it was very topical, and lots of products started to be called open something, yeah, in a, in a nod to being open source, but not really. Um, with the open platform, you know, there's a danger that it just becomes a marketing term. 
and there needs to be some kind of a ruler or a measure about whether this is really an open platform which complies with some of the requirements in here or whether I've just decided to call my platform an open platform because it's open in this way. Yeah? So it's an important ruler to use. The document is a request for comments. You can go to the website. You can comment against it. Uh, and that's what it's meant to be, a living document. But I would urge everybody really to read. This is probably one of the key documents that's been produced in the last couple of years, I think. And I would include the Gartner Report in that because I still think the Gartner Report, um, you need a subscription. You only get it if you're paying customer. You know, you've got to pay for that knowledge. So we're trying to open all of, all of that stuff out. Um, what else am I going to say? Okay, so in terms of um, what we're trying to do as NHS Digital within innovation and partnerships is, is support the development of these ecosystems. We'll not replay the arguments about why ecosystems are so important for regeneration of SME communities and bringing innovation in. That's, you know, that's been done to death uh, over the years by everybody. Um, but it's what are, we, what are we doing about that? Yeah, and turn up and talk and see. Oh, we need an ego system, but you know, actions speak louder than words. So, we have we've had um, three key interventions around this in the last year. Um, one was the further development of the Code of Health platform, and we've commissioned um, some additional functionality to the platform. Uh, we've moved where it's hosted uh, for reasons I'll. Um, I'm not going to at this point, um, <laughs> uh, to a more reliable hosting source, but Ed, you might need to take a look at the way you're hosting your stuff. Um, and um, <laughs> added additional functionality. Now, the, what we want to do with this platform, this key intervention, is we've seed funded that, we've started this. This is going to be a full on open source project for people to take any component of it, spin up their own, use, but also contribute to. Yeah? And what we want is we want this to be the key test bed for open platforms, a, a reference implementation model. It's not meant to be used in this form in live production time. It's for R&D. It's for learning. You maybe want to use, re reuse some of the components in your own platform or so on and so on. So we're very interested in having a discussion about how we can get the platform into this area for those, for those learning purposes. The second key intervention uh, we, we set up a, a framework with NHS Digital called Code for Health Innovation Associates. And we have a pool of um, experts, individuals from all walks of life, including some that are in this room, and including Dave Kilroy, big shout out to Dave Kilroy for going through the pain of helping to uh, um, organise this. So Dave, as well as being an SME app developer from Plymouth, uh, whose wife's a GP, um, and makes cabinets and cheesecakes, uh, is also an NHS Digital Code of Health Innovation Associate. And we, we brought these people together for them to provide support to these communities, to leverage expertise in when it's needed. Yeah? So we've set that up, and those resources are available to be consumed by the communities as well. The third key intervention, in, in, um, intervention that we made was we set up a relatively modest um, Code for Health Innovation Fund within NHS Digital. And in the financial year just gone, we have um, commissioned a number of assets that are all released open source for consumption by anybody in the world. And they are assets in, in, in terms of some are software capability, this is open source pieces of software capability that does certain things that's meant to be reused. They are being used in some live big projects, but they're meant to be reused. Um, and some of it's documentation and reports and more thought leadership work like this. And it's been quite hectic in the last three months, getting all of those um, assets delivered and made available to us. Um, and we will be spending the next quarter of this year pushing those assets out, sweating those assets, making people aware of them. They are already being used in live projects, actually. But that was the third key innovation, or, uh, intervention sorry, from NHS Digital on this road to uh, trying to build this nirvana of a self-sustaining digital ecosystem around health and care. Yeah? 
within a framework, though, because all ecosystems need something to coalesce around. Yeah, they've got to whether that's apps coalescing around Apple's iOS platform to build apps or or, or Android. <clears throat> and I think what we suffer from in healthcare are pockets of non-reusable, non-transportable innovations that can work great in an area for a period of time, but things can happen and they can die off and die away. And we're really, really bad at the adoption and diffusion of in innovation across healthcare for a whole range of reasons. So the, the attractiveness of this approach around open platforms, where actually the preferred, preferred model, really, is that this community and this geography, and I think you've got all the right people in the room, and you've got resources from the university and EU funded, and you've got people with real demand in SMEs, is to coalesce around this open platform that's being put in at Plymouth, around these open standards. That's got to be your core. Everything's got to start with the data. You get your data in an open, computable, shareable format that you're not locked into any vendor, and you know the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do and when you want to do it. So. I'm not going to labour the point, but we remain committed to this, as we do to a number of regional initiatives that are taken this approach. I think they're innovative. We think they are the future. We do think it's long term, though. You're not going to be able to do this stuff tomorrow, but absolutely taking the iterative approach is the right thing to do. Um, we'll continue to support in whatever way we can, whether that's with expertise, advice, brokering meetings, brokering relationships, putting real resources in. And I think just talking to Dave in the break, and I'm going to wrap up so you can all go for lunch, um, I think the next uh, thing that we're going to do is we're going to offer a free to attend um, open air clinical modelling course. Yeah, in this region, we'll find somewhere to host it. <coughs> We've got the resources to do it. Um, I'll let Dave and Andy and AC probably organise that. Uh, get some clinicians along, get some of the SMEs along, get them introduced to the tooling, get them to do some clinical modelling. Uh, and I'm thinking what we probably want to do as well is the, introduce that same group to the Code for Health platform um, so they can start building and prototyping on our cloud-based platform, but equally happy for people to take the components and spin it up um, in their own environment. Um, and one, one last thing that I want to mention um, which I think is relevant to this to this setup and the people that you've got in the room, is that um, we've had quite a, a really good and long-established relationship with UCL School of um, Computer Science now for the last few years, and we have access to something like a 120 to 150 UCL computer science students every year that we leverage into these communities who do research, they build prototypes, they're using the platform, they're doing all sorts of really cool things. It'd be great if we could replicate that in this geography with your university. And the reason I mention it is, is the next big project that we're going to undertake uh, with UCL, with several hundred students actually, it's probably going to last five years, is that um, we're going to start <coughs> building some open source tooling to prep healthcare data for AI and machine learning. Because one of the things I think that's holding us back, uh, which has pretty much been universally accepted <coughs> now, is that the, the um, state that the data is, that takes a lot of work to normalise and clean up that data <coughs> before it's suitable for <coughs> machine learning and AI. <coughs> You're going to have a head start here if you start persisting your data from scratch, you know, from the point that that data is uh, you know, that temperature's taken, whatever, is persisted in that open, yeah. computable, shareable format, and we will probably use an open-air repository to persist that test data in for the, for the machine learning tools as well. So there are a number of things going on, and, you know, coming today um, and hearing, it just, you know, it's absolutely brilliant. Right people in the room, right approach, forward thinking, customer behind it, university behind it, there's a, you know, my plea is you've got a real opportunity here. This is probably a once in a lifetime golden opportunity to really grasp this. And I would, you know, my plea is that people converge rather than diverge and you collaborate 
rather than compete because you will all win if you do that. Perfect. Time. You're live on the internet. Anybody any questions on the buffet? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>